get your concordance out and check the usage of the word worship in the New Testament where Jesus Christ is concerned. And you will notice that he accepted the worship of men. Not just kissing his hand or his feet or reverence, but actually calling him Jehovah God. If you doubt it, all you have to do is turn to John chapter 20 in your Bible. There, the Greek is definitive and totally unanswerable. Doubting Thomas, as he is called in church history, finds himself in encounter with the risen Christ. Jesus says to him, John chapter 20, verse 27, Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side. Do not be without faith. Believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my Jehovah God. It's right in the Greek text. Hokulio smu ho. Direct article in the Greek to use the Jehovah's Witness favorite argument, the definite article. The God, Jehovah. He called Jesus Jehovah God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have yet believed. I was once dealing with some Jehovah's Witnesses and <clears throat> One of them was a younger Jehovah's Witness in the movement. And whenever you get two of them together and one is a trainee, don't waste your time with the older Jehovah's Witness. Concentrate on the younger one because the depth of psychological conditioning is not so great. And you may penetrate. Of course, we know the Holy Spirit has to work the final penetration, but we must use all of the methods at our disposal. Concentrate on the weakest link in the chain. And that's that person. And I was concentrating on this young man. And I kept hammering away on John chapter 20. And I said, listen, it says right here, my Lord, my God. And I got his own Greek interlinear translation out, handed it to him, and said, there's the definite article. Here's your note which says the definite article indicates Jehovah God. Jesus is called Jehovah God by Thomas. There's no way out. And I showed it to this young fellow. I didn't bother with the other one at all. Well, the other one was virtually doing cartwheels to get into the conversation. He was crawling all over the table and everything else. Now, it, now it doesn't mean, I said, I'm not talking to you. But I, I want to point, I said, I'm not speaking with you. I'm speaking to him. I said, is he a robot? He said, no. I said, can he speak for himself? Yes. I said, I'm talking to him. You I talk to later. Right now, I'm talking to him. I said, can you tell me what it means? He said, well, it, it says that. It, it sure does. I said, what does it say? Read it. He was terrified by the prospect of having to read the text. This is how you know the Spirit is ministering. <laughs> See, the Word of God can be a frightening thing when it threatens your neat little package theological system, gets you all uptight. And he was really uptight. And he kept looking at the other fellow. I said, uh, is he a ventriloquist? Said, he thinks and thinks. You talk? He said, no. I said, you think for yourself? Yes. I said, if it came to a decision between the watchtower and the Bible, which would you choose? He said, the Bible. I said, good for you. <laughs> Now, what does it say here? He said, my Lord and my God. I said, who's God? He said, Thomas's. I said, who is God? He said, Jehovah. I said, who? He said, Jehovah. I said, then who did Thomas call him? He looked at the other fellow and he said, Jehovah. <laughs> well, you know, there was an interesting pause. Satan never sleeps. This fellow said, I have an answer to that. I, I want to speak. I have an answer to that. I said, what's the answer? It's got to be a beauty. <laughs> he says, I've got it. He said, you know, in that upper room, Jesus appeared. I said, he certainly did. And he showed him his hands and his feet and his side. I said, he certainly did. 
And then, he said to Thomas, put your finger into my hand, your hand into my side. He frightened him. I said, yeah. He said, and when Thomas saw him and he knew it was Jesus, he said, oh my Lord, oh my God. I said, you really seriously want to maintain that as an argument? He said, yes. And he poured in the storm, you know. <laughs> yes. I said, all right. Was Jesus a rabbi? Yes. What is the duty of a rabbi in the presence of blasphemy? Rebuke it. Right? Right. Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord, my God. He blasphemed, right? Right. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, old blasphemer. <laughs> I said, here you have a rabbi blessing blasphemy? How do you explain that? He said, we've got to go. I said, how come? We're supposed to be here for a couple of hours. You've only been here 45 minutes. Well, we've got another appointment. I said, no, you don't have another appointment. You don't really know the answers. And I said, look, let's not really argue about it too much. I said, the most important thing of all is the real Jesus. The real Jesus came back from the dead in the same body, the wounds and the hands and the feet and the side, and he is called Lord and God. Why not come to him? This illustrates one of the great truths that Christ taught. This man looked at me and his eyes blazed. And he said, I'd go to hell before I'd believe that. And I said, that's why I'm trying to get you not to believe that. You see, at that one burst, out came the real conviction. And the real conviction was, don't confuse me with the facts. The watchtower has already made up my mind. He believed it. Only the Holy Spirit can crack that mold, open the darkened soul and eyes, and bring the glorious light of the gospel. But you and I have to still be in the seed planting business. We still have to be in the defending of the faith business and in the proclamation of the word business. And God uses these things because time and again these people later come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know because I've met some of them and they all say the same thing. I was real mad, but I knew in my heart the watchtower was wrong. Now, this is what the Christian must strive for. Not to pin guilt on the individual Jehovah's Witness, but to let the guilt rest where it really belongs, rightfully, with the organization which says it is the prophet of God and obviously contradicts itself so consistently. Now, there are other passages which can be introduced on the nature of our Lord, and I think that you ought to pay very close attention to some of these. I could cite many, <clears throat> but I would like to concentrate on a few choice ones this evening. I feel that one of the key passages on the deity of Christ is one that is never really emphasized. And the reason it's not emphasized is because the average Christian doesn't see the potential that's in the passage, found in John chapter 5. I'd like you to look at it for a moment because it shows our Lord healing a man and then what came forth from that healing? John chapter 5. Christ healed the impotent man. And he said, Go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. And the Jews did, of course, what was going on, particularly the fact of the healing. And in verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working hitherto, and I am working. Now look at verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath. You should circle the word broken. In the Greek it's luo, which means loosed. Jesus never broke the law of God. He kept it perfectly. But the Son of Man was Lord of the Sabbath, and he could loose the Sabbath restriction and tell the man that he could carry his bed. That's all he did. And the Greek word is loose. He had not only loosed the Sabbath restriction, 
But he said, now this is the key, he said God was his father, making himself equal with God. You ought to circle the word equal there. We saw him. It means exactly that in Greek, equality with God. But we've already seen that the father was greater than the son, John 14, 28. If the father was greater than the son because the son was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, how then is it possible for the son to be equal with the father? It cannot be explained it is irreconcilable contradiction. Once again, the word, the watchtower, despised. But there it is. Equal with God. John 14, 28. Father greater than Christ. How do you reconcile? Answer, the only way it's possible. By recognizing that Jesus Christ was both God and man incomplete. That as man, he humbled himself to the death of the cross. And he never ceased to be God. Now, I want you to link together two verses here. And I want you to follow the exegesis very carefully. And make these notes because they'll be helpful to you in dealing with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I want you to remember John 5.18, equal with God. And I want you to go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is the great passage which is known as the kenosis passage from the Greek ekenosin. It refers to something Jesus Christ did. And we want to emphasize that particular fact because the watchtower so consistently distorts it. Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God. Now, the word being there should be circled in your Bible if you have a King James. A modern translation may have corrected it. It literally reads in the Greek, who remaining or never ceasing to be. It is a participle, who parkom. It means never stopped being. And it reads, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, never ceasing to exist in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped after to be equal with God. It's a very beautiful play on words here. It literally says, Thought equality with God was not something to grasp for or to reach out to covet. Why would he not think that? Because you don't have to covet what is yours already. And the scripture says he already existed in a form of God. Therefore, he didn't have to strive for it. It was his. That's why Hebrews chapter 1 says, He has by his inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Who? The angel. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today have I begotten. I will be to him a father. He shall be a son. That same first chapter of Hebrews says, With the father addressing the son, Your throne, O Jehovah, is for eternity. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Here you have the father calling the son, Jehovah God. I don't think we can minimize this in Hebrews 1. Certainly, we should be very careful in Philippians chapter 2. Who, remaining in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped after to be equal with God. But, and here's the beautiful word, made himself of no reputation. The Greek says emptied himself. He poured himself out and took upon himself the form of a slave and was made in the likeness of men. But we know he didn't empty himself of his deity because we've already been told he remained in a form of God or the form of God. Then what did he empty himself of? That's the marvel of the incarnation. He emptied himself of the right to independently exercise his attributes of deity. He never acted as God the Father acted through him and by the Holy Spirit. His knowledge was supernaturally imparted to him. His works came from the Father. He was totally dependent upon the Father. He could do nothing apart from the Father. In other words, when he left heaven, he said to the Father and the Spirit, the right to act as deity, I empty into your jurisdiction, and I enter the world, true deity, but true humanity. I will depend completely upon you. And he did. 
his whole ministry. He even said, the words that I speak, they are not mine. John chapter 12. The Father, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. The miracles of our Lord were worked by who? God, the Holy Spirit, at the direction of God the Father. Is there any wonder then in his great high priestly prayer, John chapter 17, the Lord Jesus said, And now, O Father, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Glorify thou me with the glory I had, past tense, I had with you before the world began. And the Father had promised to glorify him as he had before. Jesus Christ was glorified and declared to be Son of God with power, Romans chapter 1, by resurrection from among the corpses. That's why in Matthew chapter 28, he could stand up and say, All authority has been surrendered to me in heaven and in earth. Go and make disciples. He took up again in the resurrection what he had voluntarily laid down in the incarnation. And Philippians chapter 2 is your passage. True deity living as true humanity. Now follow how the Apostle Paul brings this to its logical and potent conclusion. And being found in fashion as a man, verse 8, he humiliated himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God, obviously the Father and the Holy Spirit, has highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth. Every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christus ho curios. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. How do we know that? Because it's a direct quotation from Isaiah 45, 23. Paul quotes Jehovah and applies it to the Lord Jesus. As I live, says Jehovah God, to me, Every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess. And Paul says, you know who it is? Jesus Christ, the name above every name. And that name was bestowed upon him because he was faithful as the Son of Man. Now, of course, this great passage linked, as it is, with John chapter 5, identifies the equality of the Savior with the Father in his divine nature. That's the whole point of the Pauline argument, and it should not be missed. You should also not miss Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. The Jehovah's Witnesses avoid this passage like the plague. You should therefore commit it to memory. We are told, let no one deceive you or lead you astray by philosophy after the empty rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For it is in him that all the fullness of deity resides in the flesh. Colossians 2, verse 9. Now, if you have a modern translation, it reads, In him dwells all the fullness of the deity in flesh. somatikos. There is no way out of it in the Greek text. Fullness of the deity himself was in flesh in Jesus Christ. I want to watch how our translators, who can't read Greek, got to this passage. It was too strong for them. So they changed the word theotetos to theotes, hoping that nobody would notice the change. But you see... When you change theotetos, which is deity, to theotes, which is a quality, you alter the meaning of the text, which is one excellent reason why you don't trust the Watchtower's translations. 
you take the accepted translations that are on the market today, not the Watchtower translations. They mistranslate, they add, they subtract words and meanings. It's an extremely dangerous thing to trust what they are saying. In dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, you want to follow up with Colossians 2.9. I've found a particularly powerful passage in dealing with the Watchtower people is a sequence of verses found in a book they love, the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. In the phrase, Alpha and Omega. This is a tremendously important phrase, and I never tire of emphasizing how important it can be when we are witnessing as Christians. In Revelation chapter 1, the scripture says, verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty One. Every Jehovah's Witness who breathes will tell you that this is Jehovah God. No doubt whatsoever. The Alpha and the Omega is Jehovah God. Once you have that commitment, you say, I find problems here. Because I find that the Alpha and the Omega is applied also in other senses. Oh, well, where is that? Where do you find that? Once again, the doorway swings open. In order to keep a rapport with the average Jehovah's Witness, you have to walk the tightrope of inquiry and of declaration. Deftly, lovingly, quietly, and confidently. And not get sidetracked. Watch out for hopscotching the Bible, which is the practice of beginning at one verse and taking you through a series of totally unconnected verses. Till in the end you have forgotten what you started out to discuss. That is hopscotching around the text. The Watchtower is very adept at this. And the only way to defeat it is to say, I'd rather not discuss any other text until I understand what this one says. And then I'd like to go and look at some others, but... What do you think this one means? It should be a dialogue and a consistent inquiry. And in Revelation chapter 21, Alpha and Omega appears once again, only in a different context. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The great voice speaks to him from the tabernacle. And then he hears in verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. Who says it? He that sits upon the throne. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, This is Jehovah God. How do we know? Verse 6. And he said unto me, It is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life, Freely, he that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son. Alpha and Omega is Jehovah God. Then you turn to Revelation chapter 22. Once again, usage of the term Alpha and Omega. Behold, I am coming quickly, verse 12. My reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The identification is clear. Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, first and last, is the same person that's been speaking all the way through. But the identification becomes complete two verses later. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in all the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. The person who testifies is Jesus Christ, and he identifies himself Alpha and Omega. Now, should there be, at this juncture, a pause, which is likely in dealing with the Jehovah's Witness here, you should cite three verses in the same context to demonstrate this validity. Verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly. 
Who is the one that is coming quickly? Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, first and last. Who is this one? Verse 20. He which testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The one who is coming is Christ, the identification, Alpha and Omega. There's a phrase added also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, and then the phrase, the first and the last. Remember we began in Revelation chapter 1. I suggest we return there for a brief moment. Where John, taken by the great vision which is unfolding, turns to see the voice that speaks to him, and he sees seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of it, one like the Son of Man. Verse 13. Who is the Son of Man, you ask of Jehovah's Witness? Jesus Christ. All right, so we know it's Jesus Christ who's talking. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Verse 17. And he laid his right hand upon me and said to me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Jesus Christ is identified, Revelation 1, 17, as the first and the last. Revelation 22, the first and the last. Jehovah God identifies himself as the first and the last in Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. But the most devastating of all is the verse that follows in Revelation 1.18. For the same person who says he is first and last and Alpha and Omega also says, I am he that lives and became dead. And behold, I live for all eternity and I have the keys of death and hell. When did Jehovah God, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last, ever die. The Father never died. The Spirit cannot die. Who died? <laughs> Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is designated Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, first and last, the Almighty One. These passages, when brought together, collectively present a tremendous force for the identification of our Lord. 